So this is Emma Norris, and that's Lynn Humphreys behind her. Okay. <laughs> um, we, uh, our company is based in uh, in Crewther, in Somerset. I'm, I live in East Devon, just near Honiton, and, um, and Lynn is in Crewther. Um, and we work sort of all over the country, not just the southwest. And, and um, so it's actually a real joy to to be working in Devon. We're staying in the Coast Guard's cottage down mm. below East Crawl, so and that's beautiful. So yeah, yeah all in time. all, we're having a great time. Our husbands are probably missing the attention and the the cooking, whatever. But you know, it's all it's all really lovely. We came here three years ago. Um, to do a condition survey in the church of all the, the painted timber that you have here, so the screen, the pulpit, and your ceiling timbers. So that was our first introduction. And part of it involved um, taking minute samples through the paint layers to the timber beneath. And um, just to get a sort of an idea of um, the history of the, of the, the paintwork and the gilding and also to see if there are any links between um, these different areas and um, and then with that information and also lots of other research into screens in Devon and elsewhere um, to try and find a context and that's that's all part of what we do so the first um, stage if we're lucky involves us being involved in the uh, condition survey um, but it's a bit like when you're decorating your own house. You know, you think about it. It's it's eighty percent of it is all the preparation, and then the actual work is the last twenty percent. And so it's the same with us. It's all the background. It's the history. It's the investigations. It's the trials. And then now, finally, we're, we're actually doing the work. Um, the paint samples we take are minute. So minute, I've lost them. Um, Sorry, I put them over here. We use, it's quite an interventive process. Um, and it's not done willy-nilly. There, there has to be a reason for doing it. Um, because in effect, you're removing original material and the, we're using a small scalpel. We're taking a section back to the substrate so that you can be sure that you've got all the layers but we are taking minute samples. They're less than a millimeter in diameter. We, when we're working, as Lynn will show you, if she shows her face, um, we work with optivizers. So we've got, we're looking at our work always through a magnification. Um, but the, you can pass this round if you if you're okay with handling something, but. The, the minute sample is bedded into a resin and then end on it's ground down so that the, the layers of paint are revealed and then it's looked at under magnification. Um, this is from a different project, but this is an example of what you would then see. So this gives us an indication through the layers. The bottom layer is the first, the ground layer, and in in this instance, we have our um, our ground, which is local to here. It's a red ground. It's from the, the earth pigments that you have here. It was found on the screen as well as the pulpit. Um, and that's quite often what would happen. You would use local materials to, to prepare these initial layers. Pulpits and uh, screens of this sort you have an enormous amount in, in Devon, you're, you know, compared to the rest of the country. The only other area is, um, where you get this sort of number is um, Norfolk so, or, and Suffolk, oh, so East yeah, Anglia. More, there's about 140, they think, in Devon, but not pulpits, that's the screens like this, but only about 43, I think, with the, or not, the figurative painting you see at this level on that side. So they're really special, and yeah, East Anglia is the only other place that has them as parallel. As Emma said, the red ground is very typically Devon, obviously, because the, the first layer, and it's uh, mixed with uh, um, uh, animal glue or glue, and so it's the sort of water soluble. So that's the most vulnerable layer is the first layer, and then a oil-based layer was put on top. 
And that seems to be typical across not all of the Devon screens, but nearly all of them that have been analysed today. Whereas on the East Anglian ones, the ground is white, chalk. So it's, still, it's based on the geology of the area. The, there are slight differences between the ground layers of the, of the screen and the pulpit, um, but not across the board. But, it's, but the, the paint layers that we found subsequently are so similar that it sort of indicates they would have either been painted at the same time or at least by the same workshop if it was at slightly different times. Um, we, so the minute samples, we encase them into little um, capsules, you know, like medicine capsules. And then, as I say, they're embedded in the resin. Um, I'll show you some that we took back in 2019. But last week, because <laughs> we can't, we took a few more because, again, we need to inform the the varnish layer that's been applied over the top. is two layers. It's one that's got a slight pigment in, and then another one that has discoloured over time. So they're very dark brown, and they are obscuring a lot of the detail that, and the colours beneath. And our process here is to very carefully remove that varnish layer down to um, the coloured scheme. And um, when we were looking in our initial observations on those first few days, we noticed, for example, on this moulding, um, there, I don't know if you can see, but there's a little bit of, of a gilding that's just visible there. Here, on the other hand, we've got um, black marks as part of um, the design. So we took a sample from each area. We haven't yet put them as a, a cross-section, but already um, we've found some quite interesting uh, information about that. Now, this is a bit alarming because it's, again, in such big magnification, but you can see where the sample goes down to the, the timber and cuts through. So that red that you can see is that ground layer. And basically, what has been found is, is um, a layer of vermilion. In fact, there were a couple of layers of vermilion, which is the red. Um, but also silver is evident, and that's possibly the, the dark colour is the oxidised silver that you can still see. So it wouldn't have just been gold. There would have been silver as well. Um, we're finding um, amazing greens and then the reds as well. Um, there is a glaze on quite a lot of pigments um, on the silver. There's something called a red lake, which um, was also found on gilded areas, gold areas. And the gold and silver would have shone through, but they would have had that tonal difference. Um, so quite sophisticated in, in the sort of applications that we're finding. It's a shame that sort of over time, all you really see is a rather flat, fairly uniform um, reflection. Um, this area was taken, there was a sample around the back, but essentially from this red sort of chamfered section um, back in 2019, and that shows you through the layers. So the initial bottom section here is that ground layer, and then this band represents the, the oil-rich glaze that would have been put over top to protect the quite fugitive ground layer. And then this wonderful colour here is the vermilion. And then the darkened varnish over the top. That shows you a very simple palette and not much uh, evidence in the way of retouching. And there, there are other schemes. There have been um, later schemes applied, but not across the board and, and relatively few. So you know, this is a, an old decorative scheme that we are revealing. Um, the green we took from around this area here, that's the picture I showed you early on, again we've got that ground layer and then quite a, a pale green based on a verdigris with a lovely green glaze over the top. There is a later green with glaze but um, this up to here is the original and that shows you a little bit more of the detail of the same area. When we're working um, the first two days we were here, um, apart from sort of documenting everything and, and sort of looking at it in, in closely under magnification, um, we spend a lot of time carrying out various trials to work out the best method and materials for um, 
what we're proposing to do to remove the varnish. Um, it's very important that we're finding something that will affect the varnish layer only, but be able to stop it before it affects any paint beneath, or something that won't affect the paint beneath. So we're finding that balance. It's quite tricky to find, and, and we're, we're also noticing that we're having to apply different approaches to different areas of the pulpit, because some of the colours are much more sensitive than the other. The red is quite sensitive in particular. We're, um, we've, we have a method that um, we are using to, we have these various tissues, this is a spider's web tarantula tissue, and this is uh, another material, it's a little bit like a blotting paper, so it absorbs um, any um, solvent that you put on, and we're using those as a barrier, we apply them to the surface and the solvent is applied over the top, which means that we can then quickly remove this and it removes as much of the solvent plus the varnish that has softened with that. And it helps us control the dwell time. It helps us um, sort of make sure that we're not over um, cleaning. And let's see, also with the, the swabs that we're using, we have bamboo sticks, we, we apply the cotton wool. Once the solvent's on there, cotton wool is, is gently rolled across the surface to, to we don't agitate the surface or work the surface again in case that we disturb any of the, the paint beneath. So it's quite a sort of slow, laborious um, process. But it's it's important that, you know, if if we have a choice, especially where we've got areas where the varnish has cooled and it's quite thick that we would rather reduce the varnish in those areas than overwork those areas and risk removing any of the pigment. So um, we, you know, this area obviously has been worked on to about here. Um, there are still areas that we'll probably return to, but we would rather underwork those areas than overclean. Yeah, so what materials do you use to touch up? Well, that's, we're not going to touch up, actually. We will probably, we, we haven't, I mean, until we've finished the whole thing and be able to take a step back. But um, it's, a, it's a fine balance because the varnish over the top gives you a sort of a unifying look. Mm. And when we remove that, you're getting the original colors, but they're obviously degraded and they're, and they're fragmented. Um, round the back, you, you can't see, but what we found is quite a lot of green pigment um, on the, the back of the shield, but it's it's remained quite intense close to the carved raised carving, mm -hmm. um, but on the larger flatter areas, it's it's nearly all worn off. We're conservators, we're not restorers, so we wouldn't necessarily want to be infilling, but it's a debate, you know. Um, far better that you've got, you can look at your pulpit and what you see is your original colours. And rather than say, oh, well, it's original plus a bit of, you know, how, you know. An argument for um, in-painting, if we would say, in areas of loss, where you've just, you wouldn't go over any original, but where it's missing, you, there would be an argument potentially for in-painting areas as loss, is if that area, say, had a white ground that really stood out and led your eye away from all of the original material. But we don't have that here, so we're feeling at the moment, it's hard to tell until we finish cleaning it, but the inclination is that actually there's enough information here that your eye will fill in the gaps where it's lost, as opposed to, and we don't need to restore it to what it was like. I'll give you an, ex the loss. I'll give you an example. Right? This, this, these two round so that I've cleaned down through here, this particular one, I've actually applied um, a varnish over the top. It's very subtle. It's, um, it's a clear varnish, it, it's quite matte, but what it does is it just, it sort of try, it brings the colour together a little bit and it just intensifies, it sort of saturates the colour a little bit. But with this red, for example, it's a shame that I've, to, I've had to charge this up now so we can compromise without a light, but within this red, these red sections here, it's, it, um, there are areas where there is no paint. So, but, I could retouch those little missing areas, but there is enough of the red to give you a, an overall impression. 
but I don't think it's necessary. And your eyes aren't drawn to those missing areas. I, I'm from the South Devon area of outstanding natural beauty, and we conserve and enhance. And that's exactly what you're talking about, mm -hmm. the conservation and then the enhancement. In terms of this work that you're doing, I'm really interested in the derivation of the colours themselves, because they're once again going to give us a snapshot to how this landscape was used, who lived in the landscape, and what travelled here from elsewhere. Can you say a bit about that? Well, we've already got an idea of the, the ground layers, so the locality of that. Um, they, and, but beyond that, the pigments that we're finding, the vermilion. Vermilion is, a, is an artificial cinnabar. Cinnabar is a red, would have been sourced from Spain. So they would have been either itinerant merchants bringing um, pigments to our ports locally. Um, but once you get um, the, pros the, the knowledge of being able to create things artificially, then again, that sort of relies less on, on travelling craftsmen. But um, oh, the red here. So if you look at this top bit, you, I don't know if you can see. But, can see. So you've got the red, but this area here, there's, there's, you're back to the timber. So the idea is that as a whole, you see the red rather than focusing on, on the area of loss. That's what that was about. How, how long will the project take you? Oh, um, we'll be here for another couple of weeks. Yeah. It's, um, we often find that there's, that first week is, is quite slow because we spend at least two days trying to get a method and, and the materials. And, and, then, and you want to proceed with caution while you get to know you know, the materials you're working with and how... And are you doing a wooden screen as well? No, no, just the bulkhead. Yeah. Do you think it was painted yeah. just yeah. after it was cast? Really <laughs> yes, or very, very shortly. Usually with yeah. the cross-sections you can tell because you can see layers of dirt or, or whatever, but a lot of... And that sort of indicates whether the timber had a time to, to settle before it was decorated. I mean, there is an example. You, I can, can you remember exactly where that church was, where they actually didn't get round to decorating for 45 years or something? Oh, no, the, I think the whole process, it was, um, I think, oh, gosh, I think it was Tinton Hall in um, Somerset. And the whole process of from commissioning the screen to the final finish, according to the church records or the... Um, church wardens records was 43 years or something wow. uh, whether that was we don't really know the reasons why because they didn't sort of um, state what it was but it might have been funding as opposed to just the labor i just can't imagine it was labor all of that time so i don't know if we know from the funds but and, and does the portrait date from the same time as the wooden screen this here, yeah, we think so. There's a lot of similarities, but we need to do more cross-referencing with the pigments. But yes, I would. So we've already shut that down. I was going to say we could shut that down. Late 1480. 1480 is late 14th century. So when you put the varnish on, it's left to protect. It is in the same way that they would have put varnish on before. The main difference is that the varnish we use these days will be tested for um, aging properties so whether they discolour with time so this is a very this is a non-yellowing varnish and also utterly reversible this varnish that we apply um, it's often used as an isolating layer so we would automatically put it on if we were going to do any retouching over the top so that we could remove the retouching back down and remove the isolating layer and not affect what's beneath and this one is reversible in white spirit and white spirit we found with our test does not affect the paint and building beneath so in recent decades, yeah. have the good people of Chivelstone and East Prawl looked after it? Have they used Mr. She? Or have they, uh, <laughs> no, have they you know, <laughs> you, you found no evidence well, of it I being... I think we should say that the people of Chivelstone have been exemplary. Excellent. <laughs> That's just what I wanted to hear. However, Thank you. elsewhere, we could mention places which we shall not, but <laughs> it has been less exemplary. But no, it's wonderful to see something that's so original. I mean, yeah. obviously it's been done in the past. And the latest layer could, the latest varnish that we are removing, hasn't yet cross-linked. So it sort of indicates that because it, it's not, it's difficult to remove, but it's not impossible to remove. And sometimes the chemistry makes it really, you have to use solvents that we're not prepared to use any longer to remove things. So uh, it makes me think that it was possibly done sort of post-Victorian, not really sure. 
and so maybe 20th century, but we haven't actually pinned that one down yet. Some of these materials don't change, so thankfully we are able to remove that, and it's over the, a lot of soiling. But what's wonderful is it hasn't been redecorated hundreds and hundreds of times. Mm. Can you help us out then? Beneath this area of quite degraded varnish that's around the back, um, this is on one of the, the shields. So obviously, and this is only partially um, uh, cleaned back, but you can see um, the flowers. So two here, there'd be one, another one here, two and one. But between them, we found this motif. It's a black motif, and we're trying to identify. I think it might be silver originally. It could, yes. It could, in the same way that we have the black here, it could have been an oxidized I silver. I think it would have been gold flower silver motif, but we haven't actually done the analysis of that yet because we didn't discover it until afterwards. So. And that might help with talking about your sort of locality and the people that sort of the flower, the flowers, along with fleur de lis, the sort of chevron patterns that we're finding. These are common designs that we find on all sorts of um, polychromy, or whether it's uh, carved timber or on stonework. But something like that is unique. So that's interesting. That makes us think: well, who, why, what? Does it, does it sort of connect us to something? And that that would be interesting. To so, yes, imprint that on your mind. There is another pulpit over in Holm, um, which is remarkably similar. Um, the sort of top section, there's slight differences in sort of the size of various things, but otherwise, um, I've got a little slightly more detailed one, but you can see um, it has a, a very similar sort of carving and it's attributed, it has been attributed to the same person. And um, this was uh, conserved by a colleague of ours. Um, when did she do it? Was it 2011 or something like that? 2011. 2011. Um, just after. There is a slight difference in that on these sections here, they have these applied mouldings. So they've been fixed. The one in Holm is not a complete. Um, piece of timber. This is this one is special in that it's carved from a single piece of oak, single tree trunk. Yeah. Whereas the one in Holm is, is has been uh, put together as panels. But we did notice that we have an awful lot of these holes. I mean, they exist elsewhere, but they're particularly prominent on these uprights. And could it be that perhaps there was more embellishment on on the side at one time? But then, if that's the case. What do we think about the the decoration that we're finding underneath? So they're all sort of still mysteries, and hopefully, and if there's any sort of if the photographic evidence of sort of through. I mean, obviously not then, but through time, where you could any evidence through time. How far back do your there images we, of the? Yeah, we've got we, some we, black we, and white photos, but there's yeah, not enough. No, I think they were the sort of before the times of photography. Occasionally, there was this chat called Wheatley that went around the country doing wonderful watercolours um, in the sort of um, 19th century. Oh, I should know when Wheatley was. I've forgotten. I've totally forgotten, forgotten already. As well. but, um, and they are often really useful, but um, I don't believe. Has Wheatley been here? Sorry? <laughs> <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> Look, some of the, the one in Holm, you don't see a lot of um, green. Um, this still has varnish. You can see little bits of varnish. Uh, let's see. You have to go back to front, don't you? But I mean, look at that colour. Wow. That's That's extraordinary, amazing. isn't it? And where's verdigris generated from? Is it is it a rock? Is it a mineral? Yes. 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 Yeah. Verdigris is a mineral. Yeah. Whereas we're finding we've got copper. There's no, a cop no, sorry. Verdigris. Is terra vertis a mineral? Verdigris is created copper, from the corrosion of um, copper. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. copper. Sorry. Which is it's still, it's still a mineral, but it's oxidized. Yes, yeah, so it's yeah. oxidized. Um, we've got, and so we've got, is it, yeah, sorry. It's got it's a sun. Terra yeah. We've got some that, uh, uh, yeah, made some copper acetate. 
plates that were made in, um, so those ones were in Venice Turpentine. I did these in 95, but they just kept the thing. So they, they colour can change considerably, but they were all produced in the same way, and they uh, vibrant, wonderful colours. So it is just the, as you see, you know, sort of on bronzes and things, it's that sort of the various greens that you see in incredible bronzes. And, and can you tell what impact woodworks had on this, or was it too difficult to look at? Yeah. Um, very, little. very little. And why is that? Because you'd obviously see it down there. But. Yeah, it, uh, woodworms, for the, for, for, for lazy people, really, on the mm. worm itself, it would tend to go for, I don't know, a pot full of softwood, but it would, so it, it, it will go for an easy option, basically, because of the, the effort working its way through the harder wood, and it just could be that, you know, the infestation that's happened down yes, there. Yes, when it's been damp and it was easy to yeah. munch yeah. through. Yeah. Whereas Once it's dried out, it hardens up. And, and, yeah. and this is all open. This is all mm. open. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Can I? I didn't have the things. I know. <laughs> 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 we can see it all day. That, that, that's made that out of one bit of oak. Yeah. yeah. Can, you, you have, can you imagine the size of that oak? Mm -hmm. But can you imagine, and don't forget, this was, this was carved in around about 1480. How long did it take that oak to grow to that size? When was that oak planted? Mm. That bit of wood is actually the best part of a thousand years old. Mm. Sorry, all little tantalizing glimpses. That is showing all the different reds and the gilding. It's taken along here. But it was finished on this as a way of an excuse, really. But if we take a sample, um, you always have to remember, although we're looking through our magnifying glasses and we're getting an overall impression, you, you look at something like this. If I'd taken the sample from here, and it's only probably a few millimetres away from this area, but I would have missed the gold mm -hmm. and the overlying paint. So you've always got to be aware of that. And um, who knows, in the future there may be processes to hand where you won't have to take a sample, but they'll still be able to get a more, uh, more information. There. How thick actually is the piece of wood that the pulpit's made from? Um, three inches, four inches. Yes, it varies. Yeah, it does vary a little bit, doesn't it? Yeah, it's sort but of because it's, it's areas, but yeah. So the, un, so the hidden marks in terms of how it was carved, it's not mm -hmm. going to be innate inside, it's going to be... It's going to be quite raw inside. Yeah, yeah. And, and is there anything to glean from that in terms yeah, of it sort of as the actual wood itself? And, yeah, so it's not sawn and you can no. see that it's been, um, how it's been carved out. When come you want, come have just before you go, come and have a, a little